Welcome to October 2021's installment of the Utah Angler Lecture Series, brought to you by Rocky Mountain Anglers and our generous partner, Shields. Our guest speaker tonight is Tristan Pendleton. Rocky Mountain Anglers holds monthly club meetings the first Tuesday of every month in the training room at the Sandy Shields location. Uh, hey everybody, welcome to the uh, October meeting. We did send out an email notification, but I'm wondering how many people got it in time. Uh, small crowd tonight, but we will be capturing this on video and sharing it on uh, the, the webpage and Facebook. And thank you, by the way, to Badger for, for taking care of that. Speaker tonight is Tristan Pendleton, who uh, many of you will remember from uh, the 2019 season of the fishing tournament, was the tournament champion that year. I was. Congratulations thank and thanks. And um, okay. one of the most experienced fishermen around and successful. Fishes a variety of species, locations, travels a lot. Um, we basically have asked him to tell us how he spent his summer vacation. Tell us his fishing stories, share his fishing photos, um, and we'll do a, you know, some Q&A. So uh, with that, thank you very much, Tristan. We appreciate it. By the way, guys, thank Tristan profusely. He, he had to change his work schedule in order to be here tonight because wow. usually he's working nights starting at 7. So we really, really appreciate him being able to, uh, to be here with us tonight. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, I'm Tristan. So we'll start. We could start, Badger. We could start on like just like the beginning of it. And okay. So this was with uh, with Ben. You guys all know Ben Allen. Uh, so I took him out. I think it was last October. Uh, we went out. October is my favorite time to fish. Um, springtime is almost equal to fall, but fall time uh, those walleye are looking to put the feed back on. Um, so we went out to starvation, and uh, that was probably one of the best trips. Um, we caught, I don't know, five or six, over eight pounds, nine pounds uh, in the evening. And it was, you're going sprouts, so you'll catch walleyes, you won't, you won't, and then all of a sudden, bam, you'll find a spot and there'll be eight or nine walleye there and you just pick them all up. But yeah, this that was like October, I think it was like a weekend before Halloween, so I'm afraid about this time sometime last year. Um, we can go to the next one. Tristan, how are you and BAM related? What's that? How are you and BAM related? Oh, we're not related, just fishing partners. I met Ben through uh, Rocky Mountain Anglers. Um, Good. And then he asked me to take him fishing and then he started fishing the club tournaments um, and then the catch for cure and the classic. And then last year he fished the uh, Idaho uh, Salmon Falls tournament. So. Club brothers. We just know, but by fishing, you know, that's how we meet a bunch of people and fish with other ch each other through uh, just going fishing. Uh, this is Deer Creek. Uh, this was last year um, in the fall, throwing uh, Rapalas. So this time of year, I'll go up there and uh, throw Rapalas and swim baits. And uh, you're looking for, depending on the water level, you will have big boulders and uh, the, you know, you can see them barely sticking out of the water. And those walleye like to stay around those, those boulders. And uh, you're really close to shore. Uh, usually when you get the bites, they're, you know, first cast. As soon as you hit, hit the water and I pop it, so I'll give you a little demonstration on how I throw Rapalas. Um, so you throw the Rapala and then as soon as it hits the water, I try to get to that, you know, dive the deepest as it can. So I'll, I'll smack it like you're throwing a, a jerk bait, but I'm doing that to get it to dive down besides railing because you railing, you're pulling it because most of those bites you get the first 10 feet of the shoreline because then, you know, our reservoirs all of a sudden just drops off. It gets too deep and those walleyes don't want to you know, come up after him. So with the first 10 feet, I'm trying to get the dive the deepest, and then I work it really slow. And uh, this night, probably caught, I don't know, probably 30, 40 walleye, and this one was like nine and a half pounds. And I was throwing Rapalas, uh, Berkeley, um, uh, hard baits too. Um, but 
this time of year, swim baits, uh, Rupalas, uh, any soft and plastic baits. Uh, this was all after dark? Yeah, so I started in the evening. I usually go up there uh, about like five or six and then come off the water about two or three in the morning. But yeah, usually that first 30, 40 minutes before dark. And then at Deer Creek, I find about like midnight. Midnight to like 1 a.m. is another peak. You know, fish start biting again. And according on the moon, full moon, always fish the full moon. Three days before and three days after, that's when I key on the full moon. When's the full moon this year? Uh, I'm not sure. It'll be in your uh, lunar calendar that's in your newsletter. I'll resend it out tonight. There you go. We can go to the next one. And are you fishing the north end? I mean, Tristan, are you fishing the north end? Um, let's see, we can go to that uh, Deer, uh, Deer, Creek Deer Creek on the Google images. I'll fish all over, but I do start on certain this time of year. This year will be a little bit different because how low it is, but it's going to be the same. took Ben up there last fall and we started on this flat. This flat last year was was great. We had weeds. Yeah. The weeds were there, but this year what happened is the water dropped so fast to where the weeds couldn't grow. So the water level was just declining too fast to where the weeds wouldn't come up. So you'd normally during the spring all the way to fall those weeds will be uh, so there's a, uh, this inlet right here, all the way out here, this whole uh, sand bank, and it's like uh, rock, cobble rock, but those weeds will be out there, and that's what we'd be throwing swim baits and jerk baits and uh, hard baits over top of the weeds. But uh, in the fall time, those weeds, you know, those weeds will die by the time the water gets that cold. Then we'll come over here from work this whole shoreline down. Well, mostly down here in these bigger rocks. There's a few key rocks that I know because I've caught so many fish off those rocks to where it's like you can, you know when, when it's going to happen. But, and it's, those rocks just, those big fish try to head up there and those big wall are just roaming right there. So, but uh, another thing on Deer Creek in the fall or any time of the year, uh, that the island is jigging the island. For big browns too, uh, you can go out there and vertical jig. I use Pan Optics, which is a Garmin, and I, you know, you look those up and you can see uh, the actual fish. Like it looks live, and uh, we can pull up a YouTube video of it. But uh, Ben and I were out there last year, and we were vert vertical jigging, and we caught some nice walleye and a couple big browns uh, fishing on the island in the fall. But that's a known spot all year round you go out there. Is there a jigging. typical depth that you fish when you're vertical jigging? Uh, yeah, um, 30 feet and less. Yeah, I usually don't ever fish over 30 feet because it kills the fish. Uh, you'll bring them up and their eyes will be sticking out of their head and your swim bladder will be out of their mouth. Depends how fast you bring them up, but most of the time the fish just shoots up. You know, it's, it just eventually just comes up. But yeah, I usually stay under no no more than 30 feet. When you're, when you're throwing on top of those weeds. How do you make your life not suck? Because I try that and it's just like, it's almost not worth it because I just can't, I can't get around it. I don't know how to work it right. Are you, are you grabbing weeds? Lots of weeds. Yeah, so the size of the bait. So if I'm fishing weeds where I know it's, you know, they're three feet, four feet under the water, the smaller the bell. So you want to throw a number three, a number four, a number five, and it depends how fast you reel. So mostly I'm just throwing it over top of the weeds and if you look at the weeds on a, on a clear day, you see the pockets. There's, there's just not weeds. You know, the whole thing's not weeds. There's the channel. So you have the channel that comes in right here. That channel will come out. And then you also have the river. See that channel right there? Mm -hmm. So that continues all the way down. Okay. So that they're still in the lake. And so those weed lines come up <laughs> to that on Charleston 
right, right there, those weeds will come out. This whole thing will be full of weeds, but there's pockets. So I'll throw it past those pockets and then bring it over top and those walleye will come out of the weeds and then I can work it really hard. But that's usually when you get your bites. The panoptics help you kind of target where those, those channels are? Oh yeah, even in the weeds, people think you can't see it through the weeds, but you can see cause the size of the fish and you can see the fish in the weeds. So then it gives you an idea where to cast and awesome. it tells you how far. You know, 50 yeah, yards. Ben was pretty jealous of it when he talked about uh, wanting to get one. Yeah, and yeah, panoptics. Actually, it's it's a good tool. They're expensive, but if you use it correctly, like we were fishing the Wildlife Classic, and uh, we we're fishing the four or top, five top people were fishing right next to each other, and I can see those fish. So the first morning, Ben was boat six, and I was boat twenty nine, and I get to there and he's fishing the same spot. Well, I'm looking with my panoptics, and I see four other people's boats, and I see all their baits going through the water. And I could see the fish behind their baits. And every time they set the hook, I knew they were going to get bit because I could see the fish and their baits. Cool. And so a few times I called it, they're you know, 50 yards away from me. I'm like, you have two fish behind you? And I'm, I have it on a, on a stick. Some guys like it on their trolling motor, but it just depends if you're on spot lock, then your trolling motor is keeping in the wind. So, cause your transducer hooks to your trolling motor. So I used a, a pole so I could spot lock, but then I could manually see what I want to see and that's what I was looking I was looking at their baits and then you know I can see fish, fish fall on their baits but and you can see them stacked up so that the spot that we were fishing on uh, starvation was a, a sand point and those fish were eating crawdads and perch but most probably crawdads on the sand bit on this point and uh, they were stacked up very very close to the shore to where I was having a hard time seeing them on the pen optics but I could see them up on it and cruising really shallow and yeah it had good wind but as soon as the sun comes up they pulled off and you could, and then they started roaming and everyone's three or four boats were fishing this point and that's where maybe three boats placed at the starvation classic from that point and then a couple different points but see if we can go back to uh, pictures here's a uh, Utah Lake in the spring, so this is probably, I think this was actually February. So my favorite time to fish starvation, or uh, Utah Lake is as soon as the ice comes off. So the ice comes off and that's when I do the best. After March, it's so hard to catch walleye at Utah Lake because of all the white bass. I have a hard time with the white bass and the catfish because you mostly troll in there and you bigger bait you think bigger bait that you won't catch those white bass and that's not the key man you those white bass would just uh you'll catch them with those big baits but this walleye was 12 and a half pounds almost 13 pounds i think it was a shy just 13 pounds and uh this came off of bird island is that where you fish bird island that was bird island yeah and is that your prime spot depends on the weather yeah you got to be very careful out there because we were out there and within 20 minutes we had four foot waves and if you know utah lake it's not very deep yeah and then if you're on bird island you have one side that's rock cobble rock and the other side it's lava rock and they're all different sizes so you four foot waves and you're in about eight feet of water your boat's going to go down four feet when you come down so you, a lot of people hit their boats and the rocks but you have to be very careful out there when you and it's a quite a ways out there if you launch at the south end or at the north end but yeah that's starvation where else do you fish at starvation or at utah or uh, utah lake sorry um i'll fish the inlets fish all Which the inlet uh, you have linden you have provo you have uh american fork um we're over by that waste that waste plant there's a few other inlets over there but it's just depending on the water level so last year I couldn't fish it because the water level is so far away from those inlets to where you're just fishing, just mud. You know, there's no reeds or or anything. But there's that other picture of that, that walleye. She was she was full of eggs and ready to do her duty. Uh, this was 2018-2019 uh, starvation. Um, rolled up on a spot and with panoptics, I was scanning. I first I would go through the spot with my 
with my transducers, my 2D, and my side scan, and see if it's worth it. And then I can pull out the trans or the pen optics. And uh, I'm going to this cove, and I'm side scanning it. And this whole morning was been rough. And I was there two weeks ago, prior to this time, and and uh, I was getting my butt kicked. So I pulled into this cove, and I was doing a lot of a lot of scanning. And I scanned this, and I and this is October. It was almost November this time of year. Pulling the spot, and I could see weeds, and the weeds were like crab grass, and I could see a ton of perch, and I was like, "Well, that's good." So I turn around, come back through, and side scan it on the other side, and I could just see fish stacked all over it, all the way from five feet to thirty feet. There were just bass and walleye. Roll in there, first cast, and I caught. I think it was like a 28, 29, so nine to ten pounds. First cast, and I was like, "Wow, my day just changed," you know. And then the next cast caught another one. So back to back, I caught these these two fish, and I stayed there for like 30 minutes, and I probably caught I don't know 12 or 13 fish over six, seven pounds, and it's just that one spot. And then you picked off the literal ones, but the big ones ate first, and so just just like that, you know, looking for those key spots, you can find find the fish that you're looking for. Sturgeon. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is on the Snake River. This was uh, CJ Strike, I believe. Um, took a buddy up, a good buddy that I've known for a long time. He always wanted to catch a sturgeon, went up and uh, caught him a four or five foot sturgeon. Um, if you've never caught sturgeon, there's a ton of guides that do it, and I would recommend going sturgeon fishing. It's a hoop. some largemouth at Deer Creek. I fished Deer Creek my whole life, and the last two to three years, those the largemouth have really came back. Mm -hmm. Or they've been there, and I've just never caught them. Not a bass fisherman, but try to be. And the last two years, the largemouth got some very nice largemouth out of Deer Creek. Tristan, do you think it would be helpful if we pushed DWR to put some of their, their uh, walleye Pangolins in, in Deer Creek, or with it overpopulated? Um, I, th I think the first thing that they probably should focus on is forage, because what you're we're going to see now is with the water levels going down and the weeds, you know, the the perch need the weeds to survive, to spawn, to spawn and to survive, to survive the year. With the water fluctuating as reservoirs do, that's the biggest thing that you, you're going to have issues with with forage. So if you put more walleye in there, you've got to make sure they have the, the, the forage to eat. What about, I'm just thinking of club projects uh, to, to uh, be able to create additional forage for perch to raise on, like they've done at uh, some of the other lakes around. Yeah. Would that be a a suggestion that you would have yeah I, I, mean, I don't know the numbers of perch in in, uh, in uh, Deer Creek you know there there's you get the classes you can tell because you'll catch perch that are five or six years old you know the bigger size perch from 8 to 10 to 12 inches but then the lower ones you, you know those are this year's and last year's um, that's that the biologists would have to see what's in there you know but, and that's to do with netting. You know, netting is not the best, best on lakes. You know, it tells you what's in there, but you also take out the main, the main goal of what you're trying to produce. This was a lake, uh, what was that lake? Lake McConaughey in Nebraska. So we were fishing at MWC up there, and uh, this was pre-fishing, and that that tournament, uh, you couldn't catch any small fish. All you were catching was 10, 8 to 12 pounders. That's all you could catch. Well, in this tournament, you only can have two over, but you can't coal. So as soon as you put a, a fish in your live well, that stays. And uh, so that's, that's what our issue was, was trying to catch our unders. So we caught our overs. Those, First 10 minutes of the morning, you got bam, bam, you got your overs, 
and we were fishing 60 feet of water. And there they have L wives, um, tons of L wives. And so those L wives, the storm came in and pushed them deep, and so they went about 60 feet, and they were there for like two to three weeks. And uh, so you have two passes, usually one or two passes, and there's probably 70, 80 boats, and fish in the same spot, big stretch. And you'll see, bam, bam, they catch overs, and a boat take off. And they're trying to catch their unders, because it was so hard to catch your unders. And that's what we were catching, just ogres. And then the next day, we had a tornado, we had tornadoes in Omaha, and golf ball size of hell. And uh, the water temper dropped, and it just, those fish went goodbye. You couldn't, you couldn't get your, your fish. So this was in Lake, uh, I just forgot the name of it. But that was on a tournament pre-fishing. See, this was Deer Creek. That's a Deer Creek night fishing again. Throwing shad wraps. I uh, can't remember on this one directly what it was, what bait I was throwing, but probably swim baits or uh, Rupalas. Do you use a night light to do night fish? No, unless I'm taking a lot of people out, kids. Uh, I've never caught a fish over six pounds, a walleye, night fishing. I've seen them, like you. When I put my night light out, you know, when I bought one, like the brighter the better, right? I don't know if that's the case, because walleye with their eyes and stuff, they don't like lights. But I've seen them on the outskirts of the, of the big circle around the boat. I've seen them swimming out there and they're getting the bait fish or eating the bugs. But um, if I'm taking kids out and we want to catch 100 fish in an hour, two hours, by vertical jigging, then I'll take a green light out. So yeah, tell us how you're doing night fishing because I went out probably five different times this year trying night fish. We got we got trout, but we're watching the walleye and it's just infuriating because we can see them right in front of us and we're th we, we tried everything we had in the boat trying to get them to bite and just couldn't get them. You were fishing from a from a boat from a boat. So cast them shore and they're all on the rock line. What time of year? Uh, this was month two months ago oh, really? okay uh how deep how deep were you fishing shallow shallow super so shallow. that that could be they know you're there um or they're picking off the bait that they they can see i usually fish in weeds so i'll fish you know 25 to 15 feet of water and i'll drop the light but i don't drop it down very far you know, just enough to where it's not, when the boat rocks or anything, it's not going to come out of water. And I tie a weight to the bottom of it because mine will kind of float up. And then I put it probably two or three feet under the water, or under the boat. And I'm in 15, 20 to 15 feet of water. And I'm on some type of structure. Just not, I just don't go in a random spot and set it down. Usually it's where I caught the fish before, or there's something that I know that they're there for. So that's how I've you know, jig in a night crawler and just wait and they'll come and, and it gets furious two rods at a time. But jig in a night crawler, that's and then you'll catch your rainbows. I'll throw a swim bait way out in the outskirts of the light, just a random cast, and then a creek bait too. I'll cast it out there and you'll get your big rainbows. But that's how I do. Don't do much night light fishing, but occasionally. That's on that turn again on takeoff. There's the starvation. You see weeds. Oh, no, that's the pole. So that's right there in Charleston. Just out there fishing the weeds. There's Ben. That was starvation. That was, yeah, last year, uh, around this time of year. We fished all day and then we found that spot and then bam, just, you know, it just happened and we caught five or six fish. Nuts, back to back that were just all over. And are you jigging for uh, starvation for those or those? Uh, jigging. So yeah, I always have a dead stick. So I always put a dead stick down, and then I'm casting. You know, I try to use. I get on two rods, so I have a dead stick watching that and casting at the same time. How do you rig your dead stick? I jig in the night crawler. With a weight on the bottom? Nope. I use use the. Uh, yeah, like a moon eye jig or just some custom jigs, but short shank, long shank. Try to stay short shank and I just feed the night crawler on it. And then uh, 
my dad has a technique where he has the trailer hook, so he, I would have to, next time I can show you how to tie this, uh, the, my dead stick rig up, but I have a, a little trailer hook to it too, you know, because most of the time you catch them on that back trailer hook. But, okay. and then I just, bird, yeah, I just bird, vertical jig it, and then sometimes, <clears throat> you know, I just jig it, but. Close enough weight on it so it goes down the bottom itself. You know, yeah, the yeah. Down. I have a jig, so a quarter ounce. Okay. Just depends how deep I'm fishing or windy or what I'm trying to do. But yeah, usually quarter ounce to half ounce. So that's starvation with Ben again. Same walleye. So this was starvation on the club tournament, actually, I believe, in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, that was 29 inches, and like I think it was the big fish of the year, 29 and three quarter, um, out there in, uh, I believe it was Saleratus mm -hmm. fish. I think it's called John's Point, and we were on the outside. I was chasing fish, so on, on panoptics, people think I'm just out here doing circles. I'm chasing them. Fish, I learned so much from that unit on how fish, you know, I think before they were just sitting there, you know, in the area. But I'm watching these fish, and I'm targeting one fish. I can tell a fish after learning the unit, and I'll be chasing that fish by the time I get, get him to bite. And I'm out here doing circles way out here, 30 feet of water, 40 feet of water, 20 feet of water, just chasing one single fish or a school fish. So you can see the big school fish or perch, and they're roaming. They'll be, you know, this whole room in seconds. Just They're just roaming looking for something to eat. When I got the black ones. I think we need a pan optic salesman here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, garments are good unit. This was uh, Idaho last year. Uh, it was the Salmon Falls tournament. We got first place, big fish day two, or day one. We got big fish day one, and we got comeback award. Uh, we were, or did we get? I think it was comeback word and uh, they have another one. I can't remember what it is, but basically we took the whole pot. Those Idaho guys won't let you back up there. <laughs> yeah, some of them. Yeah, some of them don't want to. <laughs> They're good guys. There's always a release the big fish. Here's my biggest smallie to date, just over six pounds. Where was that one? That was on the Snake River in Idaho, and it's uh, Lake Mc or not Lake McConaughey, uh, Wilcott. And uh, so it's in, on the Snake River. They they dam certain sections of the of the river, and that's Wilcott. And uh, that was probably October, I think, in the fall. That's when I try to get out the most and uh, catch those big fish because. Trying to get ready for winter. Did you get a weight on it? How big was it? Just over six pounds. Six pounds. Yeah. Guess it's not good work. Here's uh, the classic. This was uh, September 11th and 12th. And this was a uh, big fish day two. And that one was just over nine pounds. So we caught that. So I was fishing with Tom Davis, and uh, I was using the Garmin, and I was going down a bank, and there's boats on both of the, the points I wanted to fish. Well, I fished starvation my whole life, and there's a few other points where we sat, and uh, we caught three or four that upgraded our, our six fish that we could have. And uh, we were fishing down a bank, and I was using the Garmin, and I could see where the fish, it was hot. So Sunday, the day, first day, it was probably 70 degrees, and then the second day, it was blue skies and 80, just 80 degrees. And I could see those fish pulling out. So everyone was fishing really shallow, and I couldn't get you know, any good size walleye fishing really shallow and so what I was learning from that the Garmin is that the fish were pulling off into like 30 feet of water but
but they were on some type of structure, you know, a point or a ledge, and they were stacking up on downing. And so Tom, I told Tom, they're, you know, 40 yards this way. I could see him, and he's in the back of the boat, and I see him make a long cast, probably a 100-yard cast. And I'm fishing, and all of a sudden he hit a rock, hit the shore. He popped the swim bait off the shore, and it dropped. And all of a sudden I just see him reel up. And Tom Davis, he has, he has the most famous hooks that he reels up. He's all, Whoa! and I just see that rod bend, and then I see, whoop, whoop. I'm like, Tom, that's the one. We needed that one. Well, we had 20, I think it was like 30 minutes till weigh in. And that was the fish that we needed. And uh, we fought that fish probably for 15 minutes. Came up to the boat. Every time he came up to the boat and I went to scoop it, she went back 30 feet down. Zzz, all the way back to the bottom. All right, Tom, this is it. Comes up. Well, she'll come up and the tail was as though, you know, hitting the boat this way. And I was like, okay, hey, Tom, he's up here. Tom's 70 years old, he's fishing up here. And I look, I'm like, Tom, what happened to your glasses? He broke his glasses. <laughs> I don't know how he broke them, but he broke his glasses. Oops. So half of his glasses on, half of the other glasses is broke. And he's like, you can net it, brother. He's up here. I was like, Tom, you can come down. And he comes, you know, four times. That fish went 30 feet down four times. And we finally got that fish. And after that, we, Tom, let's go in. We got 10 minutes to go in. So we went in, cleaned up, and ended up being like eight. I think it was just under nine pounds or nine pounds. And that's still the deal. We took third on that tournament. That was the last one. You want to look at the maps or? Okay. I think that was the last one. Or is there any more you were expecting? Is that all the photos do? Yeah, I think that's all the photos. Okay. Uh, let's, let's go to starvation. So I mainly fish starvation in, in Deer Creek. Um, I'll go up to Willard occasionally, but something about starvation just pulls me there and I try to pull away from it to learn other lakes or just give it a chance and Deer Creek is, is good too. Starvation, something about that lake, it's that challenge because you can have a good trip and then you can have a, a bad trip. Just in numbers to catch a fish. You always can catch fish, but I'm always looking for that, that one fish, you know. And uh, so I'll, I'll walk through. So you have the boat ramp. Top one. Top one. So. I can zoom in a little bit too. See, maybe we turn to the left. Right. So we have. Uh, Close to the boat ramp. Yeah. Right. See the dam? That's going to be just to the west of the dam. Yes, yeah, so we turn. Okay, so we have. Saleratus up here. Right. Okay. So what I'm looking for is points or some kind of structure or shallow water to deep water. Those walla, you know, they roam and they go to deep water when, when it gets hot or ter times of the day. Not all the time. You know, it would be 100 degrees and I caught them in two feet of water. But they're up there looking for something to eat. That's what I think. Um, so I mainly fish like points and then uh, deten uh, temperature of the water and time of the year is key too. But this is a saleratus, so there's a lot of you know islands and sunken islands out here. And then you have this point right here, this is a, you can see it comes all the way out right here, and then this other point comes out here. So those are really good. It's sand, sand and cobble rock. So that's what I'm mostly looking for is time of the water or time of the year and water temperature. And then come down to Strawberry End. Uh, growing up, we used to fish under this bridge all the time and vertical jig. And there's two of the pylons down here. That's when I'm having a hard time, can't catch anything, go to those, those two bridge poles and every time you'll catch purge. Uh, trout, trout glory there, and that's why everyone fishes right there off the, off the bridge, and you can catch a ton of trout there too. And then you have the falling rock from here all the way down to here is falling rock. There's a sign. Yeah, it's like right here. There's a sign. It used to say it was in big red letters. It says falling rock, and I believe it because we've been night fishing there, and all of a sudden you hear. The ground shaker, what is that? And then 
you know, big of the, the hill for great water. And that area is really good too, especially this time of year when the water's low because you can actually fish those rocks and everything that's below the water. And it's usually around 30 feet of water, uh, feet of water. And then you get down here and then it gets really shallow. Like right now you can't even fish past right here. This is, this is all out of water. But these uh, throwing at night, throwing swim baits and hard but hard baits, fishing down in here, and trolling. This is a good good place to troll. It's usually the same depth, so you can just leave your baits. You know, calculate your baits out, and you can just go. And there's rarely any snags. Usually all the same depth. Do a lot of trolling and down there in strawberry strawberry yard. Do they spawn up the, the strawberry there? Yeah, yeah, they, you'll get, they spawn like three or four different areas of that I've witnessed. So you'll get them to spawn down here. They'll spawn down here occasionally. Most of them spawn right up here. Like right up in here. And then to the dam. So that's where they do a lot of their netting. So they'll go, Natalie says that she'll go up here one night and there will be 10,000 walleye. And then they'll go there the next day and they're looking for their eyes in the night using lights and she won't see a walleye. That's because they come in waves. They'll spawn and then they leave. So they spawn a lot of, a lot of here. And then they do a lot of netting uh, right here. I've seen, seen them do a lot of netting on uh, that island, Bird Island right there. And then a few over here. So this is this is rabbit, and you have sunken islands, and then you have right. So you have that island, and there's another one right here, and it's out of water right it's now. Out of the water, yeah. And it's a sandbar, and there's a, a buoy mark in it when it's low, and uh, that's a good area too. You can just float that sandbar or use your minkota to spot lock and just fish it and then drift it. And even vertical jigging or bottom bouncing, if you like, if you're into bottom bouncing, that's a good area to bottom bounce too, because it's the same depth, and you can work it efficiently. There's no big pumps or anything to get you stand up on. Oh, it's a laser pointer. Yeah. That's where you And then uh, there's a few others. <coughs> If you double tap it, it there, like, oh no, there, there you go. Double tap it one more time, and it'll do the zoom. If you top, double tap that top. <coughs> there we go. So you'll get weeds up here too, from like right here across. At this, when this picture was taken, it looks like the, you know you can tell it's right there, but you do get them out here. And there's a channel. That channel comes all the way out for rabbit, and that channel is good to troll, bottom bounce, or vertical jig, float it, and. Uh, they will use that channel to, to migrate in and out. Let's see. Let's go back to, we went through all the pictures. I think so. Let me check one. When you fish, uh, when you're at, at Deer Creek, have you ever fished or do you ever fish the uh, dam in? Um, yeah, I'll fish two two ends. We can go back to it and I'll show you the ends I fish. And it's usually night fishing. So I'll go on the highway side, I'll go up in there and then I'll come out. So I'll go all the way up to the, to the buoys, the furthest you can go, and then I'll work that wall down. And there's a couple points that I, I'll sit on for an hour and looking for that one fish but I'll scan it first. I'll go drive up it and then come down it and I, I'll see what's there. I, would, I just don't go to a spot and fish and hope they're there. I always use my electronics to tell me if the fish are there or what's there. Weeds, any type of. Are you spotting the, the walleye on something other than your pen optics? Yeah, it's a Lorance. So I have two Lorance units and I have my Lorance up front so that's my graph and my 2D. And then I have another screen, which is just my pan optics. So, and then on my console, I have a 16, HDS 16. 
and I use that for side scanning, 2D mapping, and watch. I can watch NFL on it. You know, on those days where it's boring, you just want to watch a football game. But um, so on Deer Creek. Let's see, let's go to the dam side. There we go. So I'll come up further as you go is like right here across and then I'll come down and float this and there's a couple points right here at night I hardly fish it during the uh, during the day up there and I'll throw big big swim baits and uh, hard baits up there and just float it and cast it and then the same thing on this side I'll fish this during the day from this point down you catch a lot of small ones in large mouth on this and this is like a good 12 foot 14 foot slope and the small mouth are up there eating crawdads and how far from shore are you uh, from shore i usually you know i try to stay a cast length away i don't get right up on it unless i'm vertical jigging or usually i try to stay away because otherwise you screw the guy in the back of the boat to where he can't get a good cast so usually i'm staying away i'm just staying in that 12 to 20 feet water range but I'll work this this point down. I'll sit here. I'll sit out here because this point comes out of ways. I'll sit out here and uh, That's the point we were uh, cast it. Like and usually I'll catch a good smallie or a good couple walleye on there, some overs. And then down down this, usually smallmouth. Lots of smallmouth down here. And then uh, you'll get into more sand. Usually it's when I hit that sand, it's like right here to all the way down here is where I get into more of the walleye. They're more in the sand flats and try to get away from those smallies because you can't keep them off. As soon as you get those smallies, it's one after another. But down here is mostly where I cast all night down through there. Did you catch many crappie up that way? Crappie? Crappie is when the water's high. I'll come in this cove, this cove, and this cove. There's a rock, and it's usually 12 to 14 feet underwater, and it's usually got some type of plant or bush. There was a tree there. I think it fell off the shoreline, and then it got stuck to a rock, and now it's gone because the water dropped and it blew away. Yeah. But that's where those crappie were. And using the Garmin, I can see the clouds of the carpet crappie and so I'll just go over vertical jig them yeah. or cast you know a little pin low baits and get them but mostly vertical jig them right but that's in that bay I've seen them over here and then uh, out here 40 feet of water so you have Is that not a rainbow point yeah let's see right right into here I've grabbed them in 40 feet 35 feet of water and you know they're crappie because there's oh. clouds of them. And you could drop down one after another. Yeah, okay. Any questions? You can pan optics that's a 3D imaging, is that what it is? Yeah, let's pull, we pull, pull it up. up. Yeah, we can pull the little clip. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I was just doing the same thing. Um, and I'm seeing prices anywhere from 1500 to over 3000 and yeah. I don't know if screen so you're looking at different units so yeah. the transducer is all the same um, it's the screen so depends how big the bigger it is the clearer the image is and you know depends on depends on what you want to spend So you can see the dorsal fin. So you can flip the fin down and side on the Yeah, so your transducer comes with the mount and you can go down, forward, and then you can get a different bracket and it's perspective. So then you're looking out from here. And you always wonder, what am I caught on? You can look at it and go, oh, it's a tree line. You can tell because it's flimsy.
Oh, well, that was more high. Well, just a question. So I'm assuming it comes in with the transducer and an imaging unit? And yeah. Head unit? Yeah, so you'll buy the transducer box. So the, the unit is separate. They do that because so you can buy different units. Uh, it's, it's screen size and then functionality. There's either you want touch screen or you want buttons. Um, Garment, made for Garment? Yep. So if I have two giant garments, I just need to look for the. Yeah, and you make sure that it. Yeah, make sure that it corresponds with the live. Model wise, it's capable. Yeah, and then so Garmin came out first with it, and then Lorenz came out with it, and then Hummingbird just came out with it, I think, this fall, a few months ago. So I've been looking at the Lorenz for a long time, but that, Lorenz is really good. Mm -hmm. They're 3D imaging. I actually bought the head unit so I could install it. I haven't done it yet. But that 3D, 3D imaging is much better than any demo I've seen over Lorenz. So I've, I've fished with, I haven't fished with the, uh, uh, um, I fished with Lorenz and Garmin. Hum, the Hummingbird, I haven't been on a boat with it, but my buddy Jake has the Lorenz on his boat. And I've seen a few differences, but I haven't seen, to me, I can feel like I dial in the Garmin. Because every time I get on a different body of water, I adjust the settings. Because the color of the water, sediment, and how deep you're fishing, and what you're, you know, you can dial into your bait. So I can cast a bait 60, 70 feet and dial it the sensitivity in. You can do that with Lorenz, but I feel like the Garmin, you can tweak a little bit more. Yeah, I've never seen the Lorenz, a demo of the Lorenz, and I was heavily into it for a while. It showed you the dorsal thing. Yeah. You could see that, that clarity. Yeah. So and especially when you're, so like I'll be casting the shoreline, I'll look, but then I'll turn it to my, that's why I have it on a pole. I'll turn it to my dead stick. So I never get surprised by that dead stick. You know, I don't all of a sudden, oh, I got a bite. I'm looking down and I can see a fish sneaking up on my, my night crawler or whatever I'm dead sticking. And I can tell he's coming up after it. So I can set my rod down and get ready. Never miss a fish, you know. You can wait for them. You can see them, they're coming after it. Or if they're not interested, you can pick it up and you can jiggle it and bounce a little bit to be able to take it. I, I, I fish in extremely deep water. Does it work well for you in like 30 or 40? Oh, and yeah. you're still getting a really clear yeah. image? Yeah. yeah, so usually 10 feet and deeper the better. When you get shallower, it, you have to turn your settings down a little bit, your sensitivity, because it's pinging so hard. But, or you'll start seeing different objects. Like it's returning false information, mm -hmm. but you turn it down. But usually, you know, 10 feet to 40 feet, no problem. I've never, I haven't used it in 80, 90 feet, but you, you usually, by the time I get that, because I set my settings into uh, freshwater shallow, and by the time you get to like 30, 40 feet, you're out of your screen, so you would have to adjust it, but mm -hmm. I'm not looking at anything that deep. Any other questions? Have you seen the Mega 360 Helix? So a lot of guys will run both of those. So 360 and either a live unit. And it's, it's changes fishing. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I get too dialed into it to where it's like a, a video game. So sometimes it's nice to go out and turn the screens off and just fish. But yeah, those 360s, they're good units. So when you, it sounds like you're using a lot of electronics. So. When you're coming out onto the lake, beginning of the day, what's like? What's your go-to? What do you start with, and then how do you work down into in your different tools and dial something in? So first thing I do is I get on the water, and I, first thing I'm looking at is temperature. So you know I dump the boat in, wait guy park the truck. The, the units are on. I turn them on before I even get in the water, but I'm, I'm looking to see what that water temperature is. That's a bit, every time I'm on there, I I go into my my settings, start my my day, so I'll start my trails and start a new category for that day. So that way, I caught that those fish. I can go back for tournaments. I'm thinking tournament mindset, and I'm like, all right, I caught that fish. What was the water temperature? Well, I put a pin on there. Every time I catch a fish, a fish I want to remember, I can push that, double click that button, and I can go back there and touch it, and it'll give me all the information: what the water temperature was, what time it was, and my trails. So that's how I plan my day. I get on there, look at the water temperature, and then I can start thinking where I want to go fish. 
So when you come back to them, you go you go based on water temperature. The, so you'll go back to the same day, days that the water temperature was the same and kind of see what was going on? Yeah, I try to, you know, I'm, that's how I am. I like to know what, why were they there? What was the water temperature? And it just gives you an idea and then you can sprout from that. You can hit a different area and chase in warmer water. So this time of year, I'm trying to find warmer water or in the spring, I'm trying to find the warmer water. And that's usually where you'll find the fish. You know, you'll hit one part of the lake and it'll be 10 degrees cooler than this other side because it's the wind's blowing northeast, you know? So that's why those electronics, they help you. It's water temperature, data that you've previously, I only can remember so much by fishing, you know, fish so much to where you forget those small details. And so those help you. And then you can screenshot, so you can, like that, those are all screenshot captures. So you, just, you can do that and put on an SD card and see weird stuff like been on rivers or lakes. Oh, there's a there's a truck there, or there's a couch. I was wondering what that was. I how, was much, how much time do you spend like after, after you've gone fishing, you had a good day, like kind of analyzing some of the some of the stuff that's on your, that, that you pulled off your. Yeah, so I'll, I'll hotspot my phone to it and then I'll pull all the data to my phone. And uh, they have apps for that. And I'll just go through there and look at my waypoints, adjust my waypoints. Sometimes I put it too, too soon or too late off the spot and kind of adjust them. So the next time I go there, I can get right on it. But usually every couple trips, I'll pull the information off. But some trips, I'll, man, I want to know why they were there, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and then some graphs, you know, they correlate with your front trolling motor. So I run Lowrance and Minn Kota, and those don't, don't pair together. But just the small details of them, why I pick them, but usually everything connects together. So I Ethernet everything. So what I see in the front, I go in the back and see the same thing. They're all Ethernet together. Could you talk about the type of line that you use and the weight? Yeah, so I usually, I'm a braid guy. Um, so the sensitivity of the braid is the best. So I wouldn't fail the bite, so, but I put a leader, always put a leader, unless I'm fishing a lake that's chocolate milk, then I won't put that leader. That leader is just so they don't see the braid, because they can see that braid. I've fished one rod, caught them on it, went to another rod that didn't have a leader on it, I'm like, I can't get a bite. And it's because they can see the line. That's what I think. It's the only difference there is. But So I'll, I'll fish 832 or uh, there's a bunch of braids, different types of braids. But What weight do you use? Uh, 12 to 14 pound test. Yeah. And it depends. If I'm all my jigging rods, I use mono. Four to six to eight pound test mono for the just sensitivity and. Right. You use a mono for your leader too, or fluorocarbon? Fluorocarbon, yep. So my leaders, I use 14 to 16 pound tests, and uh, I do that so that it's strong. But you kind of match the uh, the pound test to your braid. That's for the best knot for the knots, but usually 14 to 16 pound tests. You need not how you connecting your braid to. Yeah, you need. The FJ knot. Some of them are easier to tie in the wind. Usually, and it's windy. I try to go to the uni. Any other questions? What you, if you had to pick a lure, you're going to be on a lake. You had to pick a lure. You're going to fish with that day. That's all you got. What's your go-to lure? What we're fishing for walleye? Yeah, walleye. Well, walleye. Um, I would go with an aggressive bait. I'm I'm more of a power fisherman, so I'm looking for those ones that are willing to eat and aggressive. So I fish really aggressive, and so I'd probably go with a crank bait, so a plug um, or a swim bait. Swim baits I can be really aggressive with. Uh, yeah, probably probably swim bait. You notice when Ben was talking last week, he didn't want to be talking much about bottom bouncing. 
I don't get the feeling yeah. that that's real high up on your want to do list. I would say I haven't bottomed down in probably three years. There's been one tournament where that was, that's what won it. And I didn't pull the bottom bounce and I, was, I looked back and I'm like, maybe that's what I should have been doing. So I kind of, every year I try to set a goal. You know, I'm not really good on bottom bouncing where before it was like trolling or lead core. So every year I try to set a goal to get even a little bit better and faster and, you know, try to do, I think in like a guide mindset to where I'm trying to get set up all these lines for uh, customers. So I try to get good at every single thing or every presentation or species. But bottom bouncing can't catch a lot of fish. What's that? I said I get up, I get hung up a lot too. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah, you gotta. Those electronics will be key for bottom bouncing because you gotta know when when your contours are changing and you gotta reel up and drop down. Keeps hooks out of your face if you have kids on the boat, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank you. That was perfect. <laughs> uh,